Good evening to you all. This is, uh, as the president said, our annual Dick Cruz debate. I uh, stand in extremely large shoes. Dick Cruz, after whom the debate is named, was for many years its moderator. He recruited me to be a uh, debater very early in my membership of this round table, and I'm always going to be grateful to for that. Uh, as you glean, we have four debaters tonight, uh, each who chose the officer which they, for which they wish to advocate. We actually have two people who uh, tried to uh, advocate for Junior K. Warren. Uh, one, upon learning that somebody else had beat him to it, I think by about 20 minutes in responding to the email, said, if not Warren, nobody. So you have to admire that kind of commitment to your subject, if not flexibility. You'll notice that there are four men who are debating. Uh, that is not for lack of trying. However, as in years past, I found that uh, the female members who I approached were very reluctant, uh, blushing violence perhaps, but uh, I want to encourage anybody of any sex to uh, come forward and be willing to debate in the future. We certainly don't expect you to be an absolute expert on the Civil War. What's more important and, is you're willing to get up and uh, put your best foot forward and advocate for whatever point uh, has been put at issue in that particular debate. But we should certainly do better than having four guys. Even though they're great four guys, I would love to see uh, some women uh, debate as they have in the past, including Lily, who I see from where I stand now, who did a great job just a few years ago. It's my general approach where possible to not have people come back to debate uh, within five years when they last did it, simply to keep it open and give other people the opportunity. The debaters, as I said, did get to pick their own officers. Uh, and Mr. President Porter said each will get eight minutes. It was going to be five, but one debater who shall remain nameless insisted five minutes was just not enough for an uh, opening statement. So uh, Mark agreed to uh, raise that opening to eight minutes, then five minutes Q&A, and then a general discussion or a bubble. The order of debate was chosen at random by a drawing of lots uh, before the meeting began tonight. So uh, Gene will go first as to Gregory K. Warren, then Mel Maurer will go next as to uh, Joseph E. Johnson, Confederate States Army, the only Confederate uh, officer being discussed tonight. Then uh, Jay Collins will do Major General Fitzjohn Porter, and then John Fazio will wrap up with uh, General Joseph Hooker. As I said, this was by random draw. And of course, the winner, determined by the membership to have uh, been the best advocate for his respective uh, general, will get a fabulous prize. Are there any questions before we uh, kick things off? Are we going to do uh, and other things first, or do you want to get right into the debate? If uh, Bill's ready, we can do the uh, answer to the question. Very good. Mark, did you, uh, Bill, did you want to read the uh, question into the record, or would you like me to? No, we've got a couple more to pick up. Yeah. Okay. We'll do it at the end of the debate. Very good. Would you like me to get underway then with the debate itself? Please do. Very good. Then I will please, I will ask uh, Gene Clarish to please come forward. I will give each debater uh, a one minute warning and then a 30 second warning. I will not cut you off mid sentence, but I will ask you as I've uh, asked them all along to please be sure to uh, stick as closely as they can to the time provided. Gene. Right. Test, test. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. All right. I'm going to start whenever you're ready. Yes, stand by, please. Ready when you are. All right. I'm going to give me a countdown for two, one. Three, two, one. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gene. I'm one of the newer members of the roundtable, so it's a pleasure to meet you all. Tonight, I will be defending Boomer Kimball Warren. Most people will recognize, and he's a war buff, will recognize G.K. Warren as one of the many heroes from the Battle of Gettysburg. <laughs> Yet most do not know his full story. I think this can be exemplified in the following quote. Little Round Top guaranteed G.K. Warren at least a footnote, a major footnote in Civil War history. However, his further activities as a Corps commander made a worthy subject of real study for the Civil War. My goal this evening is not just to tell the story of General Warren and his relief of command, but to argue and to submit that this is an absolute crime to a forgotten hero of the war. So let's just set the stage, so to speak. We're gonna fast forward to spring of 1865 
The Union Army of the Potomac has been engaged in siege operations outside of Petersburg, Virginia. The last nine and a half months, General Ulysses S. Grant has been trying to break the Confederate defense here. He'll eventually look south and try to uh, issue offensive operations against Robert E. Lee's right flank. The main objective being the South Side Railroad. This is the uh, lifeline for the Confederate Army of North Virginia. The man that's going to be leading these offensive operations will be Philip Henry Sheridan. So let's quickly bring in our cast of characters. Philip Henry Sheridan, a man that comes from the Western theater, a very crude, aggressive individual. And when you look at this point during the war, Sheridan's star is on the absolute rise. And in many ways, he's become Grant's protege. Well, as anyone in military doctrine knows, cavalry has to be supported by infantry. And that's going to be commanded by none other than G.K. Warren with his Union Fifth Corps. When you look at Warren, he's an engineer, very meticulous individual, a perfectionist, an intellectual. And when you look at his, at this point during the war, Warren's star has already reached its peak. Uh, his best days at Gettysburg, Mine Run, and Bristow Station are long past him. So as you can see, these individuals are total polar opposites of one another. So it's no surprise that the offensive operations of five forces will be the first and only time that Warren will work with General Sheridan. Let's quickly bring the Confederates onto the field. So to counteract the Union movements, General Robert E. Lee will issue a small force under Fitz U. Lee, as well as George Pickett, a name that probably sounds very familiar to y'all, to intercept these Union forces. Essentially, they'll uh, find themselves later isolated at five forks. They'll bloody Sheridan's nose on March 31st at the Battle of Dinwiddie Courthouse, but still they're defending the, you know, their main goal of you know, five forks, Virginia. So let's get into the incident itself. The Battle of Five Forks, April 1st, 1865, All Fool's Day. General Sheridan's gonna be the leader and uh, ultimate commander of Union offensive operations. But the one thing he has in his back pocket is an order from General Grant saying that he can authorize Warren if he sees fit. Of course, this is never shared with General Warren. And since we don't really have time to get into the complexities of the battle, if you wanna pull up your maps, something like this is gonna happen. Sheridan and his cavalry are going to pin down the, the Confederate defenses. Meanwhile, Warren and his infantry will get set up and launch a crushing flank attack. And boy, is this a huge success. Essentially, they're able to roll up the Confederate lines, and nearly a third of Pickett's forces will become casualties. Yet, Sheridan is not happy with General Warren whatsoever. <clears throat> I think really this reaches an ultimate breaking point when he cannot locate Warren during the fighting. Well, where is General Warren? He was personally redirecting one of his divisions. And later that evening, he'll be actually leading some of the final assaults himself. <laughs> and what takes place is almost a scene right out of a movie. General Warren will look at his men, he'll grab the fifth court flag and utter, now nah, boys, follow me. This will be the last fight of the war and off will charge into the Confederate position. His horse will be shot and killed underneath him. And one of his own men will actually have to dive out in front of Warren to shield him from enemy fire. When Warren returns back to his command later that evening, one of, uh, he'll find an order from General Sheridan relieving him of his duty. He's absolutely thunderstruck. Surely this has to be a mistake. When he rides off to see General Sheridan and ask him to reconsider his decision, the angry little Irishman will utter, reconsider, hell, I never reconsidered my decisions. Obey the order. From here, Warren will go off to see General Grants. Now put yourself in Grant's shoes. He's been waiting nine and a half months for an opportunity to break the Confederate lines. And the news at Five Force is just that. So when Warren shows up with his protest, do you think that fell on deaf ears? So let's get into the aftermath. What happens after Five Force? What happened to General Sheridan? He'll ride off to fame and glory, one of the heralded heroes of the war. What about General Warren? He'll be given some backward posts, both at, at Petersburg and later on Vicksburg. He'll resign his commission from the Army of Volunteers and transfer back over to the Corps of Engineers. He'll go from the rank of Major General all the way back down to Major. When you look at the rest of his career, it really consists of two major things. One, engineering projects, and two, trying to redeem his name and his legacy. One day, Warren will get his day in court, but not until 14 years after the battle. Again, 14 years. When they go to the Court of Inquiry, one of the things that's really interesting is that uh, they have a hard time finding out why Warren was relieved of his duty. So they have to come up with four imputations. We'll get into a little bit that here in a second. 
So why did G.K. Warren not deserve his fate? If there's anything you take away from my presentation tonight, it's the following three major items. Number one, what happened? G.K. Warren was relieved of his command, not in the wake of defeat, but a resounding Union victory. Five Forks becomes known as the Waterloo of the Confederacy. Without Five Forks, you don't have the breakthrough of Petersburg, the capture of Richmond, Lee's final retreat and surrender at Appomattox. You also cannot blame that this is a lackluster performance. When you look at most of the fighting that takes place at Five Forks, this is done by Warren and his infantry. Point number two, well, why did it happen? Why was Warren released? When you look at the immediate aftermath of the battle, it's really kind of unclear why Sheridan relieved Warren outside of just being frustrated and some petty grievances. Yet when it goes into the court of inquiry and they develop these four imputations, when you analyze these imputations, they're erroneous at best. One of the charges that Sheridan will bring forward and why he relieved Warren of his duty was because he argued that Warren was not at the front of the battle. One minute. Well, as you just heard, Warren was almost killed or wounded in leading some of the final assaults. But the last point, I believe this is the most important criteria when you hear the other speakers tonight, is what is the overall lasting effect? G.K. Warren worked tirelessly to clear his name, yet it takes 17 years and seven months for that report exonerating him to be made public. But perhaps this is the saddest story of them all. Warren will pass away three months before those relief the public service. Those findings are made public. 30 seconds. He'll, he'll, never, he'll go to his grave without closure nor vindication. And I think to really understand Warren's sentiment in his final days, I want to share one last quote with you all. And this is what he tells his wife. He will say to his wife, Emily, when I am dead, see that I'm not buried in uniform. Allow no military escort to convey me quietly to my grave without pageant or show. I die a disgraced soldier. Gerald Warren, the heralded defender of Little Round Top, the forgotten hero of the Civil War. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, sir. How many, how many troops are in this court at five points? I believe it's anywhere between 20 and 30,000. But now remember the biggest thing is that it's a, a joint operation between him and the cavalry. So of course you have uh, you know some of the famous folks that we all know, Custer with the cavalry. Um, Saint, uh, I love this expression, uh, you know, Saint Lawrence Chamberlain is obviously going to be under Charles Griffin and his uh, division. So Warren will bring three divisions to Five Forks. It'd be uh, Charles Griffin, uh, Romaine Errors, and then also uh, Crawford as well. Uh, when Warren is relieved of his duty, Charles Griffin will take over. Um, but I believe it's anywhere between twenty and thirty, but. Of course, that's a million dollar question because who's all there that day and who's you know, sick you know, on the roster <coughs> rules and everything else. So that's you know, probably the best guess. Yes, sir. You referenced <clears throat> petty grievances. And Sheridan had a uh, reputation for taking offense very easily. Oh, yes. And could you comment on what those petty grievances might have been? Absolutely. So, of course, you know, in an eight minutes, I can't get into the, the full story of Warren and Sheridan. They do have one other run in early on in the war. Um, most folks you know, that are civil war bus will know the Overland Campaign. And during the Overland Campaign, uh, Sheridan will race the Confederates to Spotsylvania Courthouse. In doing so, and with any, again, civil war army, cavalry is always supposed to lead the way, you know, screening operations. And when Warren's trying to rush to Spotsylvania, Sheridan's cavalry is kind of slumping in, in the road, and some uh, verbal words are exchanged between the two. And it seems like, and this also kind of later tra uh, transition to, there seems to be a little bit of a kind of butting heads, if you will. And this will actually show up when uh, Grant tells Sheridan that you're going to be working with the Union Fifth Corps. The first thing that Sheridan says is, well, can I work with the Sixth Corps? Right? <laughs> the reason being is because uh, there seems to be some of these petty grievances with Warren, but also, too, the Sixth Corps and uh, Sheridan really worked together in the Valley Campaign of 64. But still, I find it really you know, fascinating. As soon as he gets again that, you know, oh, the nearest Union Division is the Fifth Corps. That's who you're going to be working with. Sheridan immediately says he wants to work with the Sixth Corps, who's not going to be able to. Pretty much Grant tells him, you got to suck it up. <laughs> Yes, sir. I forget the exact quote, but in Grant's memoirs, he said that he considered Warren to be very intelligent, but that he was not very good at responding to things that were happening. 
Absolutely. Uh, so that's a great question. And when you look at Warren, he is a fascinating individual because this is a man that um, can be very, in all of the places when it comes to emotions, he can be very kind of depressed. He can also be very interesting <laughs> in terms of the regard uh, during the uh, um, you know, Petersburg campaign, uh, there was times where that uh, he would take like cannonballs that didn't explode and have full-fledged military honor funerals for these cannonballs. So he's also a very comedic guy. When it comes to uh, Grant and Warren, they, these two absolutely despise one another. Well, it's one of the things that does come up and I think kind of help answer your question to, to really understand the sentiment. On April 18th, this is now, remember the surrender at uh, FMX is April 9th. April 18th is an opportunity that Warren could you know, get things right with Grant. <laughs> Where Grant can reinstate him in the army. However, Grant does not want to go against his protege, Sheridan, because if he supports Sheridan, then that goes against his protege, and that now um, that friendship could be temporarily temp tarnished. So if Grant was here tonight and he was hearing anything I had to say with Warren, he will say yes, you know, he's an intelligent individual, but he was not cut out for the you know, his tactics to style of warfare. Again, uh, Sheridan um, is one of those guys like Grant. The guy that likes to attack head on. The guy that likes to, again, no, not dilly dally around, doesn't want to hear an excuse why things can't be done. The problem with Warren is Warren's an engineer. He, his biggest, um, I guess, fault is that he likes to see the overall battlefield. And sometimes he will um, kind of butt heads with the commander saying, oh, maybe we should do this instead. But when Grant or Sheridan hear something like that, they don't want to. Again, it's attack, attack, attack. So if Grant was here tonight, he probably wouldn't be very happy I was defending Warren, especially since it goes against Sheridan. Any other questions? Hmm. All right, thank you very much, Gene. Yep. Next we have Mel Maurer, if he'd please come forward. <coughs> Great. Oh, I wish I was. Great oh, capital. <laughs> All the time turn. Soon forgotten. Look away. Look away. <laughs> Look away. Mixing land. <clears throat> uh, before we begin, I have to apologize for my hearing. It's not doing too well today. My hearing aids are not functioning. So. I may have to walk among you to get your questions. I'll Not to intimidate you, but to get you. I'll repeat them for you, Mel. I'm sorry? I will repeat them for you. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. The firing of Confederate General Joseph Johnston, second only to the immortal Robert E. Lee as a leader. <laughs> One who successfully commanded armies throughout the war was not militarily or politically in any way deserved. In fact, it was one of the biggest mistakes of the whole war. It led to the loss of many lives, the fall of Atlanta, the re-election of Lincoln, and the destruction of an army effectively ending the Confederacy's last hope of winning. The only way the South could prevail against the much stronger United States was by fighting a war of attrition. Attrition wearing down the North by gradually taking away its people's will to fight, their will to win. This was especially true and important in 1864, an election year. Many in the North were ready to quit. Let them go, let them go. We heard more and more. And now these discontents could do something about it by voting against Lincoln. Such thoughts were reinforced when the Democrats platform called for a negotiated settlement to the war. The conservative Johnson, commanding the Army of Tennessee, resisting Sherman's army in Georgia, knew he was greatly outnumbered and would lose if he took Sherman on head on. He also knew his attrition strategy was working, drawing out the war, increasing Northern impatience. 
Was his strategy working? Hell yes, it was. <laughs> Grant's siege of Lee's forces at Petersburg seemed like it could last forever. And Sherman's pursuit of Johnston's army was growing more and more desperate as that army refused to take on a full battle. Instead, taking defensive positions, briefly fighting, and then slowly moving on. Johnston had protected his army while holding off Sherman, keeping him from Atlanta, creating more and more frustration in the North. Someone else knew it was working too, Lincoln, as he wrote in a blind memo to his cabinet in August. This morning, as for some days past, it seems exceedingly probable that this administration will not be reelected. But Lincoln need not have worried. Jefferson Davis had saved Lincoln's presidency and lost his own by firing one of the most respected generals in the war on either side. He then replaced him with the recklessly aggressive John Bell Hood, promoting him to his first assignment as commander of an army. The army loved Johnson. They hated Hood, a poor leader, one who had sabotaged Johnson in getting his command. General Jacob Cox, who fought against Johnson and Hood, called Davis's decision one of the most controversial of the war because Johnson was doing exactly what needed to be done. It made no sense, except that Davis, perhaps for personal reasons, Davis did not like Johnson after feeling offended by Johnson earlier in the war. And Davis, who clearly didn't realize he was winning the war by not losing it, compounded his mistake by picking someone to replace him who was a complete incompetent. Hood immediately took the offensive, attacking Sherman at Peach Creek, <clears throat> costing him 2,500 men. He then attacked, losing 5,500 men, forcing his retreat into Atlanta with a decimated army, one that could not even defend the siege. On September 1st, Hood left the city, assuring Lincoln's victory. The disastrous failure of Hood also shows how well Johnson was doing and how undeserved and how stupid his firing was. Hood then left what was left of his army to two more disastrous battles in Franklin and Nashville, which destroyed the Army of Tennessee, the only loss of a whole army in the entire war. No, Johnson did not deserve to be replaced professionally or personally. The Confederate Congress agreed and pressured Johnson to Davis to restore Johnson to new commanding positions, which he did. Hood, if the war hadn't ended, would have been court-martialed. Had Johnson remained in charge, Lincoln may not have been reelected. There would be no Franklin, no Nashville, no Sherman's march to the sea, and the Confederacy could have won. As you can see, no other firing in the war was as undeserved as that of General Joe Johnson. Thank you. Bravo. <laughs> Question. Question. Yes, sir. What was the reason? Mel, I'm sorry. Please stay at the microphone and I'll repeat I can't the question. Hear. Oh, I'll gonna, repeat it for you. Okay. What was the reason microphone. Davis gave for getting rid of it, removing Johnson from his command? What was the reason Davis gave for relieving Johnston of command? He felt that he was not aggressive. And, he wanted to and of course, being aggressive would cost him his army. And that is why he wasn't aggressive. Which if you uh, look at Johnson's career, was what he was. Uh, if Nan were here, it would look like I'm pandering. Maybe he's watching. But uh, Johnson was similar to George Thompson, an excellent general, but a conservative general. And he did well throughout the war doing that.
Mel, as I recall, Davis relieved Johnston in, was it mid-July? July 17th. Is there any realistic possibility that Johnston, having fought and fallen back and fought and fallen back, would have been able to save Atlanta before Election Day? Before Election Day, probably not, in all honesty. But I think he would have prolonged it. And in prolonging that war, of course, was winning for the South. The shorter the war, the earlier it, its defeat. I think it's a probability, maybe not a possibility. But Lincoln sincerely was very worried. It's in writing. His cabinet didn't read it till afterwards. It's in writing. Well, to those who would say that uh, Joe Johnston was the Confederate version of George McClellan, how would you respond to that? <laughs> You're lucky you're sitting that far away from me. I picked it by yes. purpose. <laughs> I don't know if there was a comparison to McClellan above any general that was alive. Uh, that, uh, as I say, my comparison would be to George Thomas. Uh, you know, McClellan never fought exactly. Uh, Johnson did. And he was successful in a number of uh, instances the way he fought during the war. And it, it might not have been showy, but I think if you examine his tactics and how they worked compared to the tactics of others that, uh, let's say, were more aggressive, he would come out on top. He was the highest ranking Union general to go south, much like Robert E. Lee, a son of Virginia. And when Virginia uh, seceded, so did he. And with apologies to Dave, some consider him every bit the equal of a General Lee. And if you look at the tactics of Lee, he wasn't always that aggressive himself for good results. Thank you, Mel. Thank you. Sorry, I'm going to. Now, Jake Collins will speak as to Fitzjohn Porter. Tell me when you're ready. I'm loaded, I trust. <laughs> I won't shoot. You ready? I'm ready. Very good. Please proceed. I'm honored to participate in this debate with such distinguished debaters. I have zero debate experience myself. Well, that's not quite true. I have far too often debated with my cat and my wife, <laughs> who are both accomplished debaters. I've managed to win a few debates right. with Oliver, my cat. But my wife, Donna, well, she's undefeated. <laughs> I did persuade her to accompany me tonight so she could treat, critique me later. And I wish to thank her for her attendance. Donna. Fortunately for me, as the facts and the truth are on General Fitzgerald and Porter's side, it's unnecessary that I be an accomplished debater. The question before us is who least deserved his fate, and that Porter was the only one who was not just removed from his command, but he was actually court-martialed, found guilty, and kicked out of the army in disgrace. This was a far worse face, fate. So if Porter was innocent of all charges, it's rather obvious that he deserved his that he least deserved his fate. When McClellan became commander of Army of the Potomac, Porter quickly became not only General McClellan's loyal friend, but his most trusted advisor. Porter served solidly on the peninsula. For this, he was promoted to Major General. When Porter was withdrawn from the peninsula and set to reinforce Pope, he contributed to his own downfall by his comments in several personal letters. Pope had a poor reputation in the pre-war army. For one thing, he was known as an habitual liar. In one letter to General Burnside, Porter made slanderous comments about General Pope. Burnside namely turned the entire letter over to the administration, thus completely poisoning Pope and the Lincoln administration against Porter. Pope came east and pompously declared and acted like Eastern Army commanders were fools and that he, Pope, would handily give Lee's army a sound thrashing. This attitude came back to haunt him when Stonewall Jackson stole a complete march on Pope, going around Pope's right flank and showing up in his rear, destroying the huge Union supply depot at Bristow Station. 
completely surprised Pope thought he could defeat Jackson in detail by, he, by cutting off his retreat. I think you have heard the saying, it's not what you don't know that hurts you, it's what you know absolutely for sure that ain't so that hurts you. There was a lot that Pope did not know. But even worse, he believed contrary to the evidence what he wanted to believe and what would benefit him. Thus he ordered his troops to converge on Jackson, assuming and trusting that Lee and Longstreet were far away. The first day of the Battle of Second Bull Run on 829, Pope thought he had ordered Porter to attack Stonewall Jackson's right flank. This order, a masterpiece of poor communication, was typical Pope. It is historically known as the Joint Order, sent to both Porter and General McDowell. It read in part, you will please move forward. The whole command shall halt. It may be necessary to fall back. If any considerable advantages are to be gained by departing from this order, it will not be strictly carried out. So at one and the same time, Porter was ordered to advance, halt, and retreat, or do whatever he thought best. At 4.30 p.m., Pope sent Porter another order to wit, push forward into action at once on the enemy's flank, and if possible, on his rear, keeping your right in communication with General Reynolds. Keep heavy reserves. Pope also advised Porter to fall back to his right and rear, forced to retreat. Porter never attacked on the 29th, and it was this lack of action that primarily resulted in his court martial. There are many flaws in this last order, namely, one, due to rough terrain, it was impossible for Porter to extend his line to join with General Reynolds. Two, Pope was unaware that McDowell, Porter's superior, had earlier marched away with half Porter's force. Three, Pope assumed the order was delivered at 5 p.m., when in reality, it was two hours on the way, arriving at 6.30. Pope, believing what he wanted to believe, thought he had Jackson Corner without Lee or Longstreet anywhere near, and all he needed was for Porter to attack, and the battle was won. Porter did not attack, because first, he received the order too late in the day to organize an effective attack, and second, he felt there was a superior force in his front that would result in a severe defeat. Thus, he used his discretion as commander with local knowledge not to attack. Look at your map. The top shows what Pope thought the situation to be. The bottom shows the actual situation. Longstreet had been on the field since noon. Pope, totally delusional despite the evidence, believed Jackson in ret retreat. The following day, Porter was ordered and did attack Jackson. Longstreet was only too glad to take advantage of Porter's open flank and routed Porter from the field. Porter's corps suffered 2,100 casualties out of 6,500 engaged. In the battle's aftermath, Pope looked like a total fool, which he was, and the administration looked equally incompetent in placing Pope in command. A scapegoat was needed. Porter, on the wrong, of the wrong political persuasion and a McClellan confidant, was quite convenient. Pope clung to the belief that Longstreet had not arrived on the 29th and that only Porter had attacked, Jackson would have been the hapless victim. Thus it was all Porter's fault. And Pope maintained this belief even 20 years later. The court martial was politically orchestrated for a predetermined result. Porter's conviction to quote from Radical Sacrifice, page 270, Quote, by the end of the trial, Porter's attorneys had deduced that most of the court members were determined to find their client guilty, no matter how much evidence weighed against them. Every single objection was decided in favor of the prosecution, often through blatant hypocrisy, and that the rulings on evidence were so superlatively absurd as to almost destroy every hope of justice. At the time, both Pope and the Lincoln administration needed a scapegoat. And so Porter was conveniently convicted. He spent much of the rest of his life trying to prove his innocence. Part of the problem during the war, no one on the Union side really knew when Longstreet arrived. It was not until post-war that Confederate records and soldiers could, could be consulted. Finally, in 1878, the War Department issued an order creating a board of officers to re-examine the case. After almost a year-long inquiry, the board released its findings. Quote, point by point and unanimously, the board rejected the verdict of the court martial. One minute. Oh my God. But there followed no part in a reinstatement. Since at least 1869, Gerald Grant felt certain Porter had done something worthy of punishment. 
Porter wrote Grant and sent him a copy of a letter General F. Alfred Terry had written. General Terry, coincidentally my cousin, had served on the review board. Terry stated that in 1862, he had thought Porter guilty and only after diving into the record and examining accurate maps did he find he was mistaken. 30 seconds. Grant did a thorough review of the evidence and found the Pope had deluded him and the rest of the public for 20 years. Who least deserved to stay is the question before us. Residing Joe Hooker, retreating Joe Johnson, or engineer Warren. Warren. Porter was the only one court martialed and as I have demonstrated, fraudulently convicted. He suffered by far the worst fate of the four. He was totally undeserved as found by subsequent objective review board and by act of Congress. It, thus, it should require a little deliberation to vote General Fitzjohn Porter as least deserving. In conclusion, Porter was a true fighting general and at the proper time was more than willing to pick up his sidearm and his sword and lead his troops forward. Yes, five minutes of questions. Yeah. What would you characterize as Porter's best day of the war? What was Porter's best day of the war is the question. Probably Gaines Mel. He did quite well defending against Lee's attacks and on the peninsula. And he, he was attacked by two or three to one and maintained the defense most of the day, although he did end up retreating. Would have been interesting to find out what kind of general Porter really would have, would have become. Guess I answered everything, huh? I got one. Did McClellan ever stand up for him? Did McClellan ever stand up to him for him? You know, that's a good question. They did remain friends. Um, I don't recall that McClellan ever said one way or another. Part of the problem was at the time, you know, Pope and declared that Longstreet was not on the battlefield and that all that, if you look at your map, it looks like if, if the situation was what Pope thought. Yeah, it was obvious he should, should have attacked, but uh, that was not the situation. And nobody knew that until after the war when uh, the Confederates were consulted and they started doing accurate maps of the battlefield. Wasn't a lot of his problem was the fact that Clellan had a coterie of generals that supported him and uh, wasn't in Clellan's best interest for Pope to do well. And whether that was a big problem because of the letters that Pope wrote to Burnside and other people that were published. And Pope was afraid that uh, Porter would not attack uh, at went at the proper moment because he, they wanted McClellan to, to fail. Now I give, uh, I don't think Porter ever would have done that. McClellan, I'm not so sure. You know, McClellan made a lot of very bad comments about taking over the politics in Washington and he said he hoped Pope would fail. On the maps, uh, what percentage of Pope's Situation was the national situation. Not only is Wall Street not a Pope's perception, but Jackson's position was completely off. How could the Union Army have been had such bad intelligence to not play on Jackson? The question well, is, real... the question is, given the map available to uh, Porter at the time, which appeared to be seriously mistaken as to the whereabouts of the Confederate forces. How could that be held against him? Well, Pope was a, a totally total fool and incompetent in that, that regard. He let Jackson march all the way around his right flank and come through through Fair Gap in the Wolf, Bull Run Mountains. He didn't post any any Union soldiers at the Gap. He didn't even know Jackson had, had come around the far side and got in his rear until all of a sudden this huge supply depot was started to burn up. And uh, he, Pope was so foolish, he, he never thought about, well, he just assumed Lee and Longstreet were sitting where they were sitting and never again uh, tried to cut off Longstreet and Lee from rejoining Pope. Again, he left Thoroughfare Gap totally undefended. He, he had very bad information. 
And he believed what he wanted to believe despite all evidence to the contrary. There were people who told him that, that it was not the way he thought. And he believed throughout the two day battle that ja he had Jackson on the run and all he had to do was attack and he would win a huge victory. Totally delusional. I have one, if I may. Given what you say was the very political nature of his prosecution in the first place, did he fare any better under subsequent Democratic administrations, such as Andrew Johnson, a war Democrat, or ultimately Grover Cleveland, the first Democrat elected after the Civil War? He didn't fare any better under Johnson during, uh, for a long time after the war. He, he wanted an, uh, to reopen the court martial and, and re-examine it, and it was not politically expedient to do so. Uh, you know, Lincoln did sort of approve the court martial, and that would have made Lincoln look bad if they decided that Porter was not guilty and nobody wanted to do that. And Lincoln, um, he didn't totally read the total report of the, the court martial, but the, the actual papers that were submitted to Lincoln contained none of the evidence uh, for Porter, it was all the evidence against him. And at that time, uh, when he was convicted, Burnside had just suffered a devastating defeat at Fredericksburg. Uh, the administration looked like total fools that they kept putting one incompetent general in charge after another. So it was very beneficial for the Lincoln administration to say, oh, we would have run one bull run. If only Porter had attacked, it would have been a huge victory. Not our fault. Sound familiar to the present day? It's never our fault, right? All right. Thank you, Jake. Sure. Don't forget your pistol. I'm not forgetting the, the pistol's real. This is fake. <laughs> Next, we have John Fazio advocating for Joe Hooker. Thank you, William. Thank Sorry. all of you for coming. I am here to re rehabilitate General Joseph Hooker, who, because of his loss of of the Battle of Chancellorsville to Robert E. Lee, despite outnumbering Lee by more than two to one, has gotten an undeserved bad rap for 156 years. Hooker gained a reputation as a fierce fighter in the Second Seminole War and in the Mexican War, receiving three brevet promotions in the latter war for staff leadership and gallantry. In the Civil War, he solidified his reputation by distinguishing himself at Williamsburg, Seven Pines, South Mountain, Second Bull Run, Antietam, and Fredericksburg. Because of Burnside's terrible blunders at Fredericksburg and the Mon March that followed, Lincoln appointed Hooker commander of the Army of the Potomac in January of 1863. In addition to his reputation as a spirited and dogged combatant, Hooker acquired a reputation as a commander who cared as much or more for the welfare and morale of his men as he cared for his own and his men loved him for it. He took command of the Army of the Potomac when its morale was at its lowest after Burnside's debacles. And after reforming it, he could say and did say that he had the finest army on the planet. And let it not be forgotten that this was the army that triumphed at Gettysburg, a result for which Hooker deserves much credit, but of course never received it. At Chancellorsville, his plan had made eminently good sense. If properly executed and barring any freakish happening, it was almost a certainty that it would result in a Union victory. The plan called for George Stoneham's Cavalry Corps to raid the Confederate rear behind Lee's lines for the purpose of disrupting his supply lines and keeping him off balance. The raid was totally ineffective. Lee had his eyes on the Union Army, not on his supplies. The plan also called for Hooker to pin down Lee's army before Fredericksburg using John Sedwick's Sixth Corps for the purpose, and then take the greater part of his army westward to flank Lee from that direction. He posted Dan Sickles' Third Corps to command the Union Center and Oliver Otis Howard's 11th Corps to anchor the extreme right. Sickles moved out to attack elements of Jackson's force that were in front of him, a movement that did nothing more than create a gap in the Union line and isolated the Union right. When Jackson threw his 26,000 men force against Howard, 
The 11th Corps was not only totally isolated, bicycles move, but it was also totally unprepared for the hammer blow. The men were at ease having their supper. Many even had their arms stacked and all were facing south when Jackson struck from the west and northwest. His men roaring and crashing out of the woods. Now, surprisingly, the 11th Corps collapsed utterly, taking the Union Center with it. So now three subordinate stonemen, Sickles and Howard, had failed fighting Joe, but that wasn't the end of it. Recall that Hooker had posted Sedgwick before Fredericksburg to keep Lee in place. Sedgwick had 47,000 men under his command. When Lee realized that Sedgwick wasn't going to attack him, he left 10,000 men under Jubal early to deal with Sedgwick and took the main part of his force westward to deal with the main part of Hooker's force. Sedgwick, therefore, had early on number five to one. And when he finally moved, Sedgwick did push early aside, true, but then got bogged down at Salem Church, six miles from Hooker and the rest of the Union Army, losing an encounter there with elements of Lee's army and thereby forced to retreat across the Rappahannock rather than saving his commander's fortunes. The failure of Hooker's subordinate officers was now complete. And now for the freakish happening. While Hooker was leaning against the porch pillar at the Chancellor House, which was his headquarters, a cannonball struck it, split it lengthwise and hurled half of, half of it against, uh, against Hooker, uh, striking his head and feet. He lay unconscious for 30 or 40 minutes and was assumed to be dead. When he regained consciousness, he tried to mount his horse to reassure his men and his troops, but he collapsed and vomited. Clearly, he was very seriously injured, not, not senseless in fact, and spent the rest of the day in a comatose condition, most of the time having to be woken to communicate or wandering without a clear head, according to the records of those who were around him. He was, from the moment the cannonball struck, hardly a man who could command an army of 133,000 men. What else could have gone wrong for Hooker that day? Not much. And yet he wears the jacket of blame for the defeat. Why? Well, believe it or not, for nothing more sinister than a footnote. It appeared in a book called the title of the campaign of Chancellorsville by John Bigelow Jr., a highly regarded author and a highly regarded work. The footnote recounts an alleged conversation between Hooker and Force Corps, uh, First Corps Division Commander Abner Doubleday on the march to Gettysburg a couple of months after Chancellorsville. In response to Doubleday's asking Hooker what had gone wrong with him at Chancellorsville, Hooker allegedly said, Double Bay, I was not hurt by a shell and I was not drunk. But once I lost confidence in Hooker, and that is all there is to it, unquote. Because of Bigelow's reputation, this quote, or a variation or derivative of it, found its way into the works of almost every historian of Chancellorsville, of Hooker, and of the change of command before Gettysburg. That the exchange never occurred and is not even a flagrant corruption of something that did occur is immediately manifest by the fact that we know with certainty that Hooker was seriously injured by the shell from his own statements, as well as those of the men who were with him at the time, a fact that is wild, wildly inconsistent with the alleged confession that he was not so injured. Further, in the weeks following the battle of Chancellorsville, Hooker had said often that he attributed the defeat not only to the injury caused by the shell, but also to the failures of his lieutenants. And still further, tracking the movements of Hooker's headquarters and First Corps headquarters during this period shows that they were dozens of miles apart and that Hooker and Doubleday could therefore not have met at any time between the march north from the Rappahannock and the date of Hooker's resignation. One the source minute. of the footnote one uh, is Major E.P. Halstead, one of Doubleday's wartime staff, who included it in a letter that was written 40 years after the event, a letter unfortunately acquired by Bigelow as part of his research, which is replete with inaccuracies pertaining to first core actions at Chancellorsville. Am I out of time? 42 seconds. Okay. In October 63, he sent and Lincoln sent him to the Western Theater. He won a brilliant victory, storming Lookout Mountain, the Battle of the Clouds. Received another promotion for it. He then fought with distinction in the Atlanta campaign under Sherman. And when the Corps Commander James McPherson was killed, Sherman was replaced. Sherman replaced him with Oliver Lotus Howard, 
a double insult to Hooker, who blamed Howard for the chancellor's new defeat and because Hooker had more seniority and experience than Howard. So Hooker resigned. Hooker died in October 3rd, 1879. He's buried in Cincinnati Spring Grove Cemetery. His combat record is better than that of any other general in the Union Army. Thank you. Certainly. Any questions? Go. As you were alluding to it towards the end of your presentation. Would you please repeat? Uh, John, if you'd stay okay. at the microphone, I'll repeat it for you. All right. Thank you. I perceive you bounce back pretty well. What do you attribute this to? Why was Hooker able to bounce back relatively well after the shell incident at Chancellorsville? Go ahead. Well, how did he bounce back? I'm sorry, what? Yes. Why was he able to bounce back so well after the incident with a shell at Chancellorsville? Well, he, he did not bounce back so well. He did not bounce back at all. He was very, very seriously injured. And the, the shell, his injury, which was caused by the shell, had much to do with the loss of the battle. He might have rallied, he might have rallied had he been in good health. You know, he might have turned the tide uh, uh, after, uh, after Lee made his uh, major move against, against his forces, but he was in no position to lead a 133,000 man army anymore. I meant, I meant later in his career. Later in his career, how did he recover oh, so well? Later in his career, he recovered. What I mean, what else can you say? He did recover from the injury, it wasn't fatal. He did recover. And uh, he, he did well, especially at Lookout Mountain and, uh, and in the Atlanta campaign. Lincoln knew that he was too good. He was, had too much talent to toss him away because of differences he had with Halleck and, uh, and some of the other Union high command. Obviously, if Lincoln hadn't known that, he would not have retained him and sent him into the Western Theater, which he did. Do you think, John, perhaps Hooker is an example of the Peter principle? He was better suited for corps command than for command of an army and was best at that lower level? I don't think that. Michael no, Hooker. I think he was, I don't think that's the case at all. I don't think he is, uh, I don't think the Peter principle applies to him. I think he was every bit, uh, he had all the talent he needed, all the skills he needed, all the knowledge, military knowledge he needed to be a commander of the Army of the Potomac. He had a very, very bad day. A lot of freakish things happened. Well, a single freakish thing happened uh, with the cannonball and so forth. But he was also let down seriously by four of his subordinates, none of whom had any success that day. Can it be that all four failed him? It is, in fact, a, a fact that they, all four failed him. Go. <laughs> to what extent do you think Lincoln's decision to accept his resignation was the result of Hooker's loose talk prior to Chancellorville about becoming a dictator or the nation needing a dictator. I don't think it had anything to do with that. That uh, well, everyone, I think just about everyone knows about that comment. Uh, you know, Lincoln had certain reservations with respect to that ill-advised comment, but I don't think that had anything to do with his accepting his resignation shortly before Gettysburg. He accepted his resignation because Hooker asked for the troops that were stationed at Harper's Ferry and he was refused. He was refused uh, by Halleck. And so he resigned shortly before uh, Gettysburg. But I wanna repeat for emphasis that the, 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 the army that wanted Gettysburg was Hooker's army. It was the army he had lifted from the horrible uh, state it was in after the uh, Fredericksburg campaign. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if, there's, if you read anything any place about uh, his staff considering having asking him to step down at, at uh, Chancellorsville. Excuse me. Yeah, Chancellorsville. Um, Did after he was in, in other words, he, he staff could have requested to uh, he step down and somebody else take over. Right? Should Hooker's staff have recommended that? Hooker relinquished command to another general after his injury at Chancellorsville. Well, he probably, you know, I don't have the details on that, quite frankly. He probably did. Uh, he probably did relinquish command, but there wasn't anyone apparently who had the military uh, know-how that he did and everything collapsed. With the other four subordinate uh, generals failing him, 
And with this incident, it, he, he didn't have a chance. And it's just unfair. It's unfair uh, that he has to wear the jacket of blame for the loss of that battle. And, and, uh, and uh, the, the subsequent uh, decline, if you will, of his uh, uh, reputation, because he was a very fine general, a tough fighter who loved his men and who, and who was loved by his men and deserved a better fate. But, you know, fate is a tricky thing, as we all know. Thank you. Could I ask all four debaters now, please to come forward and we'll have a uh, round robin. Questions may be posed by those in the uh, audience and you may yourself take issue with what might've been said by your fellow debaters, if you wish. I'll ask each of you to step up to the microphone when you wish to speak so that those watching via Zoom can hear you clearly. I didn't hear what you said. <laughs> You may mix it up among yourselves. You may criticize any remarks made by others, or if there are questions which meet, which those in the crowd wish to ask of all of you, you may do that. Let me begin this. John, why, should, why shouldn't Warren be the least uh, deserving one? I don't have an answer to that question as such. I think that everyone up here has made a case as far as I'm concerned. Uh, uh, Porter uh, certainly was uh, treated unfairly. I'm absolutely convinced he was. And as, I'm also convinced that Warren was treated unfairly. The hero of uh, Little Round Top? I mean, come on. And, and, and who was he spanked by? Sheridan, a uh, little brat from Somerset, Ohio. <laughs> oh, 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 that's what he was, a so, little brat. The brat, anyway. And uh, certainly Mel made a, a very persuasive case. So I, you yeah, know, I'm, I'm almost to say hard to. Shame to say this now, John. No, I, good I, thoughts, but yeah. but yeah. John and I, as you may know, debate often, and we usually debate quite a bit before the debate. But you kept saying it was his army at Gettysburg. Yeah. Well, it shows what a good general can do with an army. Absolutely. If they know how to use one. I couldn't agree more. One hundred and thirty-three thousand men, and he, he couldn't a, win. He couldn't win because he was mm. he was knocked unconscious for forty minutes. Mm. And when he got up, he got on his horse, he fell off and vomited. Obviously, That's probably the, the best was... thing that happened to him. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, Johnson, uh, no, no question. I think I agree with Mel firing Johnson. It was a bad move. However, I heard Mel say that he yeah. thought if Davis hadn't fired Johnson, the South still had a chance to win the war. I frankly, Mel, I'm, I'm very skeptical of that one. I don't think that uh, the South had any chance to win the war after when? Spotsylvania and Grant's turn at the Plank Road, Brock Road intersection. That's what sealed the South's fate as far as I'm concerned. Even more than Gettysburg and even more than Vicksburg, the South still won a major victory over those, after those major Union victories, namely Chickamauga. So the South still had a chance to win the war uh, after those major Union victories, but no longer after Spotsylvania, Tenito. Okay, let's hear from the other two debaters. Gene, it's been the longest since we've heard from you. Would you like to have a word? Yes. Why, why should your guy win? So when analyzing all four individuals, everyone had great uh, points out brought this evening, but really I broke it down to a simple three criteria. What happened? Why did it happen? What was the overall effect? I think the most critical again is the overall effect. When you look at uh, all my other colleagues here this evening, uh, Warren will go to the grave without the closure of indication. Fitz John Porter will get uh, ultimately reinstated back in the Army, and two days later will resign his commission. So he goes to his grave with closure. When you look at uh, Joe Hooker, when he uh, after he gets relieved of command, why did he get relieved of command? A defeat. Again, he offered his resignation to Lincoln. But then he'll go west and do great things. And then when you look at his legacy, he'll pay a painter $20,000 back then uh, to paint a portrait of himself during the Battle of Lookout Mountain. So I think he was pretty happy with himself and that had found his vindication in life. When you look at Joe Johnson, one thing is that he does get relieved of command, but he also gets reinstated in February of 1865. He's uh, kind of a little engine that could for me, a guy that, you know, <laughs> Been several times opportunities to prove his worth, but his strategic tactics overall do not work. He uh, will pretty much give up the entire Confederacy for withdrawing tactics. I mean, he almost lost even at uh, 
Peninsula campaign, almost gave up Richmond until Robert Lee took over. He was up Vicksburg, Jackson, Mississippi, and, and even Atlanta. Um, so again, in terms of his vindication going to the grave, I think he knew he had every opportunity presented to him, yet still failed. Um, so when you look at Warren, again, he's relieved for, again, a major victory, almost killed Moody in action to achieve that victory that ultimately wins the war. And again, goes to his grave, still to this day, does not know whether he was publicly exonerated or not. So that's what I'd like to pass him as a rebuttal. Thank you. Jake, would you like to have a word? Yes, please. Uh, my first rebuttal is uh, he actually did know the results of the inquiry before he died. Even though he, was not public. They, he had a hunch, but it was still never I, out. I don't know. The book I have said he knew, knew what the results were. But they didn't come out until three months after they he They didn't come out until after he died. But well, he was a fortune teller. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, you know, things do leak in, in, the, in the government. So um, as far as Warren goes, uh, yeah, he was the hero of Little Round Top. Uh, you know, he did what any private in the 20th Maine could have seen, that that was the key to the battlefield. And I, I asked, you know, where was he all day? Why didn't he find out that Little Round Top was undefended until late in the afternoon? What was he doing the rest of the day? <laughs> oh. Remember, he wasn't relieved at Little Round Top. He was hailed as a hero. Give him command. He remember at that time, he was just the chief of uh, engineering. Promoted to Fifth Corps General, which was held by who? Uh, George Meade, the Army of the Potomac. So I don't think he just gave away his corps freely nilly to anybody, and let alone against Williams being Sabre. But again, he's relieved at five force, not yes. Yeah, I, real, I realize that. My question is, was he really the hero? He just happened to light up the hill. Where, why wasn't he? Why didn't he find that out earlier? But anyway, and one one more thing on uh, you know, we, I I agree it was unfair that he was relieved by man. But he had the reputation with Grant and with a lot of the army that he was too much of a micromanager and he could never let give orders and just let them happen. And that Grant was tired of that. And that's why Grant gave Sheridan the, the opportunity to relieve him. So that it, while it was unfair, it was also for the good of the service. And that Sheridan did, did not do it in a fit of temper. He had to have thought about it beforehand because the person who should have taken command of the Corps was Crawford, who was actually the senior division commander, but he gave it to Griffin. So, since I've been attacked on both sides, I would just like to point out that it didn't take years to undo the damage to, to your guys. Johnson was reinstated almost immediately by the Confederate Congress, proving that his replacement was not competent and he was the man that should have stayed. Well, I agree his replacement was not competent, but what were you going to do? Let Johnson retreat all the way to the Atlantic Ocean? I mean, you've got to take a chance. When did Johnson ever take a chance? Is your option to wipe out your army? No, your, your option is to take a chance oh, and win. Right. Was there zero percent chance that you win? No, we had to take a chance, but it was retreat, retreat, retreat. No, uh, strategic withdrawal. <laughs> <laughs> well, no comments for Hook. He had the best combat record of any any general in the Union Army. His record before Chancellorsville was brilliant. His record after Chancellorsville in the West was brilliant. He does not deserve to be ranked with, with the likes of Burnside and Pope, but he is, and that's where the unfairness is. Thank you. Well, all I can say is anybody who asked to be resigned, to ask to resign, who did submit his resignation, how can that be unfair if he asked for it? Yeah, but he had good reason to. He was humiliated. Well, sometimes you got to suck it up. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and you know why he had the, the name Fighting Joe Hooker, right? Yes, I do. You want to tell everybody why? He, it was a clerical error. <laughs> <laughs> and he said he didn't like it. However, I have to say, I think he probably did like it. There are a few things that a person, a man or a woman, appreciate more than recognition. I, I think he liked it. Okay? And incidentally, it has nothing to do with prostitution, by the way, his name is <laughs> linked to prostitution. It's nothing to do. The word hooker was in use many, many decades before he came on the scene. It has to do with, you know, the image of, of women hooking their clientele. That's where it stems from. It has nothing to do with his name. Uh, one more thing on hooker, you know, he had the reputation of the pre-war army of being the best poker player in the army, yeah. except when it came time to go all in, and then he always failed. And that's what happened to Chancellorsville. 
Oh, oh. I wasn't going to say this, but since John brought it up, Booker was known to be quite a ladies' man. Yeah. Well, so what's you, might, going at? you might even say that he could have been caught with his pants down. He might have. Yeah. And he was. And not far off. Yeah. Let me say something. I, I, I think that uh, too, too much is made of, you know, the business of being smitten with women or maybe women being smitten with him. Too much is made of the smiting business. If it weren't for smiting, none of us would be here. So we should be glad that women are smitten by men and men are smitten by women. Say so like one, what he did was he patronized prostitutes, which was common enough, which was common enough in the, uh, in the Victorian era, because the free stuff, there wasn't enough to meet the demand. Let's hear from the I, I heard you claim your support of this, and aren't you responsible? The debate yeah. is finished, gentlemen. Right, thank you. I'm surprised yeah. it ended on the hooker note. <laughs> Many thanks for those who participated, both here in the uh, dining room and also those watching via Zoom. Uh, the votes are tallied. I want to thank uh, Lily and Hans for their help in the tallying, and our winner uh, by a relatively narrow margin, but still decisive, is Jean Clarence for GK Warren. Yay. <laughs> May I am uh, the parents of Jason Ford and receive his fabulous prizes. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you so very much. And it's customary for me to uh, show off the fabulous prizes to inspire others to become debaters in future years. So you get an American Battlefield Trust hat. Thank you. You get an American America's Hallowed Ground, American Battlefield Trust, personal battlefield journal, with stickers. Stickers <laughs> to be placed as he visits each That's of those battlefields. <laughs> Triumph and Defeat, Vicksburg Campaign by Terrence Winchell, who has spoken to this round table and also is a well-known guide to many of you. Your choice of two, count them two calendars. You may choose to keep one and pass along another to a loved one. There is the Friends of Gettysburg uh, Foundation calendar for 2022. And there's the American Battlefield Trust calendar for 2022. <laughs> and finally, the Battle Maps of the Civil War by the American Battlefield Trust, the Western Theater, including a picture of Lookout Mountain, which uh, many of us had the pleasure of standing on not long ago due to uh, President Porter's very carefully planned field trip which was a lot of fun and you'll notice this has a three hole punch so you can stick it into a notebook take it out open it go to just what you need to see and gene congratulations just want to say really quickly thank you so much this was an absolute fun and blast it was a really great time uh, be able to research more but also be that voice and that one little kind of last thing I just want to leave everyone this evening is that as uh, next time you make your pilgrimage to Gettysburg, you sample a little round soft, you look at the amazing beauty, take your photo. One thing I ask it is now that you know Warren's story, that uh, you know, say a little thank you to him because again, I don't think he gets that you know, good enough credit as we have discussed this evening. So again, thank you so much. It was a true honor to have worked with Warren. Here, here. Well, before you go, William. The round table has a little gift for you. A bottle of wine donated by Dave Carino. And the label on the bottle reads, Unfairly Ousted Officers of Valpo Vichella de Baudre. Featuring <laughs> not only the four officers you were talked about tonight, but also William's picture on the label. Oh. <laughs> so if he ever loses it, he can find it and he'll know it's his with our compliments thank you so much thank you, thank you.